In the first part of Brent's presentation, he talked about some of the things that they had observed that led them to believe that they had something other than the armyworm and helicoverpa species that they were used to seeing in maize. And indeed, the positive identification of fall armyworm was made from collections on the 11th of March, 2020. Um, and you can see here in a field in the Burdekin, Brent, um, with a couple of colleagues, Hugh Breyer and Lisa Kelly, who went up specifically to uh, have a look at those infestations. And one of the key things that attracted Brent's attention and made him wonder whether they did have something new uh, was this windowing that's not typical of the armyworm species, uh, northern armyworm, or of helicoverpa. And it was quite widespread in the crop and it was associated with small larvae uh, feeding primarily under the surface of the leaf. Here's another photograph that just shows how extensive that uh, windowing was on the plants and um, was really quite indicative of there being some other species there uh, in addition to the Northern Army Women Helicoverpa they were used to. As the larvae grew and uh, their damage got more extensive, you can see on the left hand side that the leaves started to exhibit holes, not just window, more extensive window, but also holes. And that uh, was definitely not something that they had observed previously uh, in maize. This collection of images of fall armyworm of later in stars shows the sort of colour variation that you can get. There is some consistencies uh, in the striping uh, and in those key characteristics that are recommended for identification of fall armyworm being the pale inverted Y on the head capsule, on the forehead essentially, and the four dots arranged in a square towards the tail end. And you can see that very clearly in the larva in the middle photograph, uh, which is probably a sixth, fifth or sixth in star larva, uh, where those characteristics are very clear, clearly demonstrated. The larva on the right, uh, a very small head capsule coming apart away from the collar uh, because it has um, or is recently molted or molting. And this slide illustrates again uh, those very characteristic features of the fall armyworm. Um, that's a fairly green uh, one, but you can see that characteristic striping, the arrangement of the dots on the rear end and the pale inverted Y. And the picture on the right just illustrates how the feeding that was pretty apparent in the vegetative stage becomes much less apparent as the crop starts to enter the reproductive stages. So uh, the evidence is that at the level of feeding that they experienced during the vegetative stages, the impact on uh, the subsequent crop growth is minor to insignificant. Typically, um, most, you know, most of the cobs um, by far only had a single fall arming worm grub in the top there and you know, the, the, uh, the damage um, exhibited was basically the same as, as what you'd expect from you know, a single helicoverpa grub as well. So we move on to the next slide. It'll show a, um, some, an egg mass that we found in, um, in soybeans and that sort of thing. So you can see the, the young larvae have hatched out and that sort of thing. They're still in quite a dense clump. They haven't started to, to move across the leaf yet or, um, or move into uh, you know, onto subsequent other, other plants as well. So, um, and that's always, We've always, you know, I only ever found that egg cluster and that sort of thing typically on the, on the under, underside of the leaf, whether it be in grain sorghum or whether it be in corn or um, soybeans. So if you move to the next slide, you'll see um, uh, those grubs and that magnified um, under the microscope there in the office and that sort of thing. So you see that typical large black head capsule there and you can clearly um, see the defined um, um, dots and, and um, insignia there on, on their... Um, on their body and that sort of thing. And so the colouring and that sort of thing is, they look very opaque and that sort of thing. That's because of the, um, the bottom light um, on the microscope and that sort of thing. But you can see that the grub there typically um, 
on the uh, on my right hand side of my screen there you can see that green tinge that that runs through there and you can see sort of a, a pinky sort of tinge and that sort of thing so typically that's what we see that sort of yellowy green sort of um, coloration that sort of thing and um, occasionally early on before they pick up that yellowy green you see sort of that um, that sort of pinky hue and that sort of thing on the, on the coloring that sort of thing and typically we don't see um, that inverted Y and that um, being present um, on their forehead and that sort of thing until that sort of third and, um, and subsequent end stars and that sort of thing. So um, that's not a clear identifier in the, in the early end star stages based on what we've seen so far. So if you move to the next slide, you'll see typically what we see um, young grubs and that sort of thing on a soybean leaf and that sort of thing. So you can see that prominent head capsule there and you can see the, um, the collar formation forming behind that. And then you can see the formation of the um, dots on the back there in that typical um, pattern there. Um, so that you can see that yellowy green sort of um, um, coloration and that sort of thing. And that's typically what we see um, in that early, you know, um, first and second instar um, growth stage. Move to the next slide there, Melina, you can see, um, so this is obviously um, um, clustered caterpillar and that sort of thing, and you can see the, um, the uh, formation there of, of, the, um, of the couple of dots there on, on the side flanks and that there, and so typically a lot of uh, agronomists and that sort of thing early on and that sort of thing get them obviously confused and that with clustered caterpillar and that sort of thing, so typically, you know, in the early stages what we did was we, we collected suspect leaves and that sort of thing with um, young hatched larvae and that sort of thing and, and basically took them back to the office and fed them up on leaves and grew them out until it was sort of a growth stage that we could uh, clearly identify them. But we're a bit more comfortable now with what we see out there in the paddock and that sort of thing with that larger head capsule and the, and the, um, and the early um, formation of those dots and that sort of thing. So, you know, we don't confuse um, plastic caterpillar with full arming worm anymore. Um, if you move to the next slide, you'll see the, the larger um, size grubs and that sort of thing. So you can see that, that typical, um, you know, inverted Y on its forehead there. You see the, um, that, uh, the collar, you know, the capsule there on the, on the back there of the neck. And you'll see those distinct um, lines and that running um, down, the, down the body and that sort of thing. You can see that, that formation of the, um, the dots there. Um, as it moves through the body there. If you move to the next slide, you'll see a, um, a close-up of that, of that head there with that um, inverted Y and the, and the, and the white, white the creamy stripes and that running down the back there. So that's fairly typical of what we see in the large grubs and that sort of thing. It's not until we get to that sort of, uh, well, around that sort of um, instar four sort of stage that we see that clear, prominent um, inverted Y and that sort of thing. So early on, um, you know, it's quite easy to confuse um, with, you know, northern army worm or um, even helicoverter and that sort of thing. You know, they sort of have a, a, a faint sort of um, inverted Y sort of um, coloration on their forehead as well. And we get a lot of agronomists and that um, um, mistaking, you know, heliosis and that for fall army worm. The next slide will show the, um, the close up of the rear end of, that, of the grub there. So you can see that the, um, the four dots there in that um, square formation. And you can see the, um, um, trapeze type um, arrangement and then below that um, the four dots there it's, an, it's oh. inverted again so that's all right Melina that's fine um, so if you move to the next one you can see as we move through the grubs and that sort of stuff so you can see that the um, the quite you know the variation in the colors and that sort of thing um, typically that sort of bluey blue green color and that sort of thing to this sort of um, light um, brown, yellowy sort of um, colour and that sort of thing. And the next one will clearly show um, that more that typical um, coloration, that sort of thing as they move, um, you know, um, towards the end of their of their life cycle from a larvae point of view. So we do see quite a variation in colours and that sort of thing. Um, so it's 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 not easily identifiable just by one distinct colour and that sort of thing. We, it's like helicoverpa and that sort of thing. We see a multitude of, of different colours in in the larvae and that sort of thing, but Typically, um, as they move right towards the end of their lar uh, that larvae stage and that sort of thing, they end up in this sort of colour from what we've seen so far. And they do get quite fat, um, a lot fatter and larger than a, well, fat, definitely fatter anyway than a uh, heliosis of a, of a similar in stage, in star stage. Uh, the next slide will, will, will show um, some, um, you know, damage in that within within uh, sorghum and that sort of thing. And, um, and you see these large grubs and that sort of thing, and you'll see 
on the leaf there behind it, you can see those big deposits of um, frass and that sort of thing. And, and that's typically what we see um, from these larger grubs, sort of three, three, four, fifteen star. You see a lot of frass and that sort of thing. And, and um, it actually fills the world up on, you know, on some plants and that sort of thing. And, and um, an easy and early indicator of, you know, whether or not the grub is full army worm is typically how much frass is, in, is involved in that, in that world. Move down to the next slide, you'll, you'll see a, a, a better representation of that. So you can just see the, the amount of, of frass involved in, that, in this large grub there that's been uh, chewing on, um, on some sorghum plants. So, um, so that's typically what we look for and that sort of thing is, you know, you see those sort of bullet hole a typical effects and that sort of thing in the next slide there on those couple of plants there. So you can see that, you know, they've done quite a bit of damage and that sort of thing. And this is typically from um, grubs that we, we see multiple grubs per plant. So certainly seen up to four, um, four armyworm plants, uh, sorry, um, grubs in a, in a single plant. So typically three to four, um, you know, the damage gets quite serious in that, in that early vegetative stage. Typically in irrigated crops, that which we predominantly deal with here in the burdekin, it's not as big an issue in the sense that, um, you know, those well-grown crops, you know, well-watered, well-fertilised and that, they do have a quite a you know, high capacity to, to compensate for that early vegetative damage. Where we've seen, um, you know, catastrophic type damage and that has certainly been in the dryland crops where we've had multiple grubs per whirl and, you know, because of, you know, depleting soil moisture levels and, and, um, and you know, um, you know and the, obviously the nutritional levels are, are less than what we would um, typically see in Irrigated crops, some of those, some of those, um, those plants and that sort of thing, they lag well behind their neighbours, and especially in corn and that sort of thing, they they, they do get overtopped quite easily, and then and then subsequently, subsequently become weeds in their own right, um, and don't really contribute to you know a, a yield um, situation. So, but the certainly the plants, you know, with single um, or even um, two um, full armyworm grubs per whirl, um, we've certainly seen um, both irrigated and dryland crops have a huge ability to, to compensate for that early vegetative damage. And along with, you know, and as per we typically get with um, Helicoverpa, unless uh, directly impacting on that reproductive tissue, um, you know, we certainly don't see any need or haven't seen the need so far to actually step in and um, interact with a, an insecticide. So, and I suppose, you know, one extent was, you know, previously, you know, back in March and in, 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 even into April, we didn't really have any registered uh, insecticides with any great deal of efficacy against um, fall armyworms, certainly in corn and, and uh, grain sorghum. And, you know, that's certainly been alleviated to a point at the moment with, um, with corn, but it's still a bit of a gap there in relation to um, grain sorghum, and which is a concern, um, and but still um, advocating um, and you know for you know more registrations and that sort of thing, or more permits and that sort of thing in that space. Um, you know, obviously success neo and that sort of thing um, is under permit and that sort of thing for those crops. But I mean, I'm not too sure about on everyone else. But I mean, none of my clients can certainly afford to splash um, success neo in um, in uh, grain sorghum crops, or even. Um, even maize, um, different story, obviously in um, in uh, sweet corn. So we move down to the next slide. Um, so just remember those two pictures there, those two plants and that there. So this is the same crop there, and you can see that you know generally you know um, looking across the crop there, it just looks like a normal sorghum crop, which it is. And um, but you know if you take the time to walk through there, you can find individual plants that exhibit a huge amount of damage and that sort of thing. And um, but once again, it seems to be cosmetic. Um, if you tag those plants and go back to them, you know later in, in the growth cycle, you'll see that you know most of the um, um, uh, reproductive tissue has been largely unaffected. And you know it was just a, would have been a mute point if we'd actually used an insecticide. Um, you know, we weren't, you know, we weren't really gaining anything. And, you know, I'm really, really pleased that we haven't taken that approach, that we've taken, you know, the approach of actually sitting back and watching and observing and, and marking plants and that sort of stuff. Um, and just, you know, following them through and just seeing what, how they do recover or, or you know, or if the damage is, is getting significantly worse and that sort of thing. And so far, you know, um, we haven't actually had to step in 
and those plants have you know um, gone through and completed their reproductive cycle and that sort of thing and and um, we can't see any any real um, you know loss of yield at all so if you move to the next slide you can see pheromone traps being set up across the burdock and that sort of thing and, and um, not too sure whether any data has been um, publicly available as yet but I mean um, from a um, um, you know, talking to the farmer and that sort of thing and, um, and getting information um, second hand, you know, typically the um, the moth captures and that sort of thing have been sitting at around sort of a static 15 to 20 percent um, and obviously the rest of the population is, is typically um, northern armyworm so we're only capturing around sort of 15, 20 percent full armyworm and in the crop picture there, um, we could find full armyworm in the vegetative stage uh, as a, from a larvae point of view. And, and that coincided with that sort of um, capture and that in the, in the trap. But um, as that crop has progressed now well into grain fill, um, we're still finding similar um, numbers of moss and that within the pheromone trap, but we're not, um, not getting uh, any larvae, full arming worm larvae in the, uh, in the head. So based on the thousands of heads um, that we've shaken into buckets and that sort of thing, furiously hunting that for full arming worm in... Um, um, you know, that early grain filling um, sorghum scenario, we're yet to find fall armyworm in the head. So plant, we can find plenty of, um, you know, sorghum head caterpillar. Um, we can find helicoverpa, obviously, and we can find, you know, northern armyworm, but yet to find um, any fall armyworm. So not sure whether that's a, a trait or whether it's just purely coincidental or whether it's because um, the numbers are extremely low at this point in time. Um, and I, you know, it makes it hard to, um, you know, when we look at the numbers and that sort of thing across the burdock and, um, and the numbers are extremely low, it just makes you wonder, you know, how much we really are going to learn from, you know, the, the habits and that of full army worm based on, on their population at, at the moment. But anyway, we'll, we'll be interesting to track them through the winter and that sort of thing and into the following spring and that sort of thing and, um, and see whether their behaviours and that do change. We certainly have seen, um, certainly in corn and that sort of thing, we were seeing the biggest numbers by far. Um, sorghum seems to be, um, you know, very, you know, secondary um, as far as uh, fall out worms interest. You know, we've got large areas of um, dry land and also irrigated, we've certainly got more, a lot more um, dry land sorghum in the area than we do irrigated. Most of the irrigated crops um, are formulated by sort of beans, mung beans and um, and maize. And so for those maize crops have certainly that sucked in a lot of pressure. Um, but once again, typically in that um, in that vegetative stage, more so than that reproductive stage. But once again, not too sure whether that's a trait um, or whether that's just symptomatic of the of the low numbers and um, and the moss, you know, is continuing the, you know, continuing on their march march or their, or their flight patterns south. So if you move into the next slide there, um, which I think is the last slide, Melina, um, you can see that, you know, that's that crop, you know, as it moves further into that grain filling phase and that sort of thing. And, um, you know, the yield potential um, is still very, very good. And, um, and I mean, we've seen minimal impact, um, you know, from that initial grazing of full army worm in, in that vegetative stage. So I suppose in, in, um, in summary, as far as, you know, what we've experienced up here since, you know, that early detection in March is that numbers are still relatively low, thankfully. And, you know, Helicoverpa is definitely the, um, the you know, the major um, pest and that here still, um, you know, we have a lot of northern army worm, we have a lot of cluster caterpillar as well, um, as well as the full army worm. And the full army worm is, you know, well down the, um, the list of, you know, um, of, um, of issues that, that we have. But... The um, you know I'm sure things the dynamics will change as we move um, further into the into the season. But at the moment, um, you know we, we're always you know vigorously scouting for fall army worm, but um, consistently the numbers you know come up relatively low. So I just implore everyone to make sure that they are um, correctly identifying fall army worm, and they do have a really good handle on the actual numbers um, out there in in the paddocks before they formulate a spray decision and that sort of thing. So Melina gave me some really, really good advice initially um, early on and and, um, and the question she posed to me was that, you know, the full army worm numbers that we're finding, if they were helicoverpa, what, what, what would I do? And the answer to that was obviously nothing. So 
because they're full army worm um, at the moment, you know, I'm taking that approach. You know, um, we're just mindful of, of the numbers, mindful of, of the damage, and we equate that back to, you know, what we would do if they were helicoverpera, and, and basically that's why we've let them go. And I'm extremely glad that we've done that. And, um, and you know, based certainly on the numbers, based on the damage or lack of damage, um, that certainly has been the correct approach. So that's pretty much my um, and that's, yeah, I didn't want to go through hundreds of photos that we've got, but um, that's a, a broad, um, I suppose, um, snapshot of what we've seen so far here in the Burbican. That's excellent. Thank you, Brent. One of the questions is just about the identification, Brent, and how difficult you found it at first, whether having mixed populations of Helicoverpa and Fall Army were made that more difficult. And I guess I know from my experience and probably everybody else, Richard and so on and yourself, we get lots of pictures and individual helicoverpa larvae. And sometimes if you just have one larva, it is a bit of a struggle to decide whether it really is helicoverpa or whether, you know, it's just that you're unfamiliar with fall armyworm because you haven't seen one yet. What would your advice be to, you know, people in CQ who are looking for fall armyworm, finding larvae and struggling to decide whether they're helis or fall armyworm? Well, that's right. I mean, you know, certainly even now in those early um, instar stages and that sort of thing, um, you know, typically you, you got to have a good hand, uh, good quality hand lens and that with you in the paddock at all times because in my, certainly in my eyesight's not what it used to be. So, and also, um, you know, we do have a, a very good um, quality microscope back in the office and that. So, so we're always carrying containers and that with us and collecting, um, you know, um, suspect um, larvae and that sort of thing and we take them back and have a really good look at them back at the office and that sort of thing and typically we're looking for that you know that large um, you know black head capsule and that, that dot formation and that sort of yellowy green um, pigmentation in that early instars and we typically don't see that inverted Y until later in the um, in the growth cycle of those larvae so certainly early on um, it's easy to confuse you know that first and second um, instar and that sort of thing unless you've got you know um, a good hand lens or a, or a good uh, microscope and that with cluster caterpillar and until they sort of get a little bit larger in size and that's something that second third instar the cluster caterpillar identification becomes you know so much easier and clearer but full army worm you know so many times i've taken home leaves and fed them up over a few days until they get into a larger size and you get used to what the growth stages are you get used to what to look out for and so that's been a huge help to me personally because initially via the web you know there wasn't any real clear concise pictures and that's thing to marry it up with what we were seeing in the field but i mean obviously you know that larger instar um, larvae there's plenty of photographs that that depict the clear identifiers but mind you you know you want to be identifying full army when before they get to 50 and 60 instar especially if you want to make an informed decision you know on, on an insecticide application so for me it's been a bit of sort of trial and error and that sort of thing collecting lots of different um, egg masses and early larvae but typically you know in corn and that sort of thing it's been relatively easy because you know that classical um, windowing type grazing pattern that we see from that first and second instar so you know now you know we've got our eyes and, and we you're just basically walk into the crops and, you, and you're scanning for that sort of early damage and then once you find that um, you know if there are larger um, grubs and that in there well then you know they'll definitely be full on when but in that early stage you know that you look for that wind classical windowing effect on the leaves and um, look under the underside of the leaves, look for the larvae or the egg masses and that sort of thing in the surrounding area. So, so far, that's all we, we pretty much look for. But I implore people, if they do have um, suspect um, larvae, take them home, feed them up on a few leaves and just watch, you know, how they, they progress. And you'll soon get your eye in and, and, and see what to look for. And also you'll be able to um, clearly identify them. Because uh, some of the, the um, photos that can be a little bit ambiguous at times so and it is it still is confusing even now sometimes so and you do end up second guessing yourself quite a bit but it's really important to make sure that you that you are correct and that you are right in the identification before we yep. we go out and start spraying there's a question here about the pattern of infestation in the crop whether you just tended to see one infestation or whether you got repeated infestations what what was your ex has your experience been so far um, so far in the sorghum, we've only seen typically one infestation. So, you know, in that vegetative stage, that early vegetative stage, it, even, you know, finding larvae and that grazing um, in amongst, you know, the, the you know, emerged flag leaf, 
um, and you know just prior to head emergence. So we've seen you know quite large full army worm even at that stage. And then tagging those plants within that grouping um, and you're going back and, and looking at those heads as they transition through that flowering phase. We haven't seen you know those large larvae transferring onto the heads as yet, thankfully, because um, that was obviously a, a big concern in some of those um, crops. Typically, most of the time we saw, you know, fall armyworm um, infestation very early in the, in the sorghum's um, vegetative stage, you know, typically in that sort of V4 and V6 stage, very similar to corn. We have seen two infestations in the same corn crop, you know, one in that early vegetative stage and then once again in that, um, in that reproductive phase, post-tasseling early grain field, we've seen a, a secondary infestation there. But that hasn't been uniform across the valley, so... Um, it's been pretty much so far we've only seen really um, one infestation um, across the across the cropping cycles, but we've seen a couple of corn crops where I've had, I've had two distinct infestations. I know that you've been in contact with some of the American entomologists who have quite a bit of experience with fall armyworm. From your conversations with them, are you under the impression that the densities that we've seen so far are well below a treatable economic threshold? Most definitely, I, I certainly believe that. Basically, you know, in conversations with the guys from the US, you know, from a university point of view, entomology point of view, but also, you know, from um, you know, nutrient ag um, solution uh, agronomists in the US, the numbers that they talk about are far above what we what we're seeing here, and certainly the numbers that we're reporting back to them, you know, they're certainly not concerned about those numbers. And also, you know, when you see what's what's happening in the crop and you follow them through, you know, they are exactly right. You know, the numbers that we're dealing with at the moment don't require a, a certainly a, an insecticide treatment. So, insecticide treatments are quite. Popular topic of conversation, not only uh, the range of products that are now available on permit and how you might use those, but also the efficacy and, and the potential that fall armyworm may have some resistance already that it's come into the country with. From what you've been hearing, and I guess you've also been speaking with CSIRO, do you have any comments about what is emerging in terms of efficacy of different products and what resistance might be expected? The initial reports and that coming back from um, the other tablelands that, that um, had an incursion um, earlier than, than we did, um, you know, there was quite a few vegetative corn crops there, up there that was sprayed twice, if not three times. I spoke to one of the egg pilots from the tablelands and he said that, you know, they were extremely busy and that sort of thing and they were, were getting repeat applications on crops and then they were getting reports back from the growers and um, also farmers that, you know, the insecticides they were using at that stage weren't giving them any efficacy against full armyworm. But also you've got to remember that these insecticides were clopyrifos, methamol and also SPs. So obviously there were single applications of those actives. They weren't combination sprays or anything like that. But, you know, those crops were in the vegetative stage. They were sort of that V6, V8 stage and those larvae were deep in the whirl, fully entrenched. And so based on the, you know, the lack of translaminar activity of those insecticides, it's no surprise, you know, that they got you know, very little, if any, result whatsoever. Uh, so, you know, I was a little bit perturbed that they were continuing with that strategy as well. Um, they didn't learn quicker. But, you know, by the time we got full arming worm down here, we were obviously concerned about it. Um, but then we took the, the approach of, you know, let's have a look and, let, and let's see what, what this um, beast does and compare it to um, Helica verbera. And thankfully the numbers have been low, so we've been able to, you know, we've been able to take that approach. Uh, without, you know, getting too much pushback from the growers because uh, initially the growers, they, the first thing they want to do was spray and, um, and I can understand that. So we basically took the approach that we weren't going to. We were going to just sit back and just see what would transpire. Um, so now that we've got, you know, permits obviously of Aldercore, I mean, that's fantastic, but that's certainly not our go-to strategy is not to get out Aldercore and start spraying because we could have quite easily done that on numerous corn crops and we haven't done that. We've tagged individual plants and followed the damage through. It's certainly shown that we certainly didn't need to spray, and so I'm very pleased that we didn't. Because Helicoverpa is still the, the dominant pest here in the Vertican, and, um, and typically we don't spray corn anyway, um, so why would we spray? Unless we had you know, catastrophic damage, that, like they talk about in the US, when they get three and four grubs per individual plant over you know, quite high densities, when then we would have to step in certainly in that regard, but 
that's certainly a, a frightening proposition as well, and it's certainly going to put our core under a lot, a lot of pressure. And so, I implore everyone, you know, um, because we have these permits, doesn't mean we ne necessarily have to use them. Take a, you know, a cautious approach and just make sure that you're fully over the numbers that you're dealing with. Take an approach of thinking, you know, what sort of efficacy are we going to get from this insecticide application? Let that um, formulate part of your process of whether we actually physically go go ahead and do it or not because there's no sense um, spraying for you know large full army worm that are fully entrenched even with algal you know it's just it's just a waste of time is there any resistance to anything i know you sort of touched on using and not using any chemical but is there any resistance at all to anything even so, overseas there's um a huge, huge amount of literature and that's from from different continents that, that, that um, show that individual populations are resistant to a, a huge um, sweep of insecticides including alcohol it depends on the individual population um, and also you know what they've previously been exposed to and also the country of origin is uh, as well so i mean certainly melina would be able to answer that better than myself but i mean certainly uh, it doesn't take much time to, on a google search to, to work out that um, full army worm can um, develop resistance to a large amount of insecticides and very, very quickly. So, you know, we certainly have to be, you know, very cautious and, and very careful in, in our approach with insecticides against fall armyworm. Same, same process with Helicoverpa as well. It's no different. So. The short answer to that question is, if the fall armyworm that we have in Queensland has originated from Asia, the CSIRO geneticists think that it will probably most likely have some resistance, probably to carbonates and organophosphates, so things like methyl chlorpyrifos, perhaps yep. not synthetic pyrethroids and not altacore. But that work has started, as I understand, looking for evidence of resistance in the populations that are in Queensland and Western Australia. And hopefully, in not too long a time, we'll know what the answer to that question is. So we've certainly um, collected larvae here from the Burdekin, and so we'll set that down for testing. I'm just wondering about the trapping. How widespread have we found for armyworm moths? And where you found them, how many, and do you keep on finding them? My impression is we've only been finding one in a trap. Is that just one in total that's been found, or are we continuing to find them? What sort of numbers are they, and where are they? That's the map of yep. the trapping so far. The majority of detections have been individual moths in traps through central Queensland. And the majority of those occurred between the 9th and the 16th of April. So a very short period of time, which suggests that it's probably as a result of a movement of moths. There's a little scale. So over this period from middle of March through to now, the numbers are very low. So the highest numbers are at these traps where we're sort of up around seven or eight for that whole period. But the majority have been one incidence of a moth and no more after that at this point. Apart from emerald. So Richard, I don't know if you want to say something about emerald. In the last couple of weeks, we found... Uh a bit of a hot spot in one of the traps in Emerald, where we found four the previous week and three full army worm last week. We also found a couple in, in Gindi. So whether that will continue in, uh, or not, it's, it's hard to say because it is cooling off fast. So it's just a matter of wait and see how that affects the trap catches. What about winter cropping? Wheat and chickpeas and I think oats are more susceptible, etc. At this point, At we, this don't point we don't expect that there will be much will... impact on uh, winter crops. Unlike Helicoverpa, fall armyworm is very susceptible to cooler conditions. They don't just slow down. Apparently, they pretty much give up. So we would expect for pretty much any area where there are winter cereals, for the most part of the winter cereal season, that you probably won't have issues with fall armyworm. I guess late autumn is one of those periods where we wonder whether in some seasons we might see them cause some early damage. But I guess under the current sort of densities, this year is not one of those years where we might expect to see damage. So certainly on the downs, for example, we wouldn't expect to have issues with fall armyworm in winter cereals. In central Queensland in autumn, it might be marginal and there might be a short window there depending on the season.
Do you have any more insights into that, Brent? Based on the um, literature and experience in the US, I'd have to agree with that. West of the Great Dying Range, you definitely won't see winter incursions and that sort of thing of fall armyworm. Even here, up here in the north here, um, you know, our median temperatures and that sort of thing do hover around that sort of 10 degrees, which we, we tend to call a frost. Probably get a lull here during the winter as well. And then it should ramp back up quite quickly in that during once we move into that spring summer phase. But certainly the saving grace and that thing, I think for those winter agricultural areas will, will be there, you know, their median um, temperatures will be certainly low enough for quite a period of time that it should um, certainly put the brakes on full army work. Does that mean that there'll be no overwintering at all sort of in the, the broad acre cropping area? We'd expect a reinfestation from the north or from the coast every year in order to have them come back into these cropping areas? Is that the way you see it? I guess that's open to some experience largely. We, we would see that central Queensland is potentially one of those areas where they could uh, survive all year round depending on the winter. But for the rest of the country, certainly anywhere south of central Queensland, we would expect that that scenario you described with a movement in mid to late summer being a fairly typical scenario. Yeah, because there's no diapause with fall armyworm. Once that base temperature gets below 10 degrees, they essentially die. So the larvae. Yep. So. How many eggs do these critters lay and uh, what's their viable level in these egg numbers? They lay thousands of eggs and the egg batches are quite large. Brent, did, have you got around to counting how many eggs in a batch? <laughs> I reckon you should No, I haven't, them. sorry. Um, that, that'll, that'll have to be on one of my um, things to do list. But the egg layers are comprehensive. You know, they are large clusters of eggs. You'd have to have a hazard a guess based on what I've seen so far. It's certainly in excess of 100. It would be quite interesting to see what the actual viability of those individual eggs are. And obviously, you know, they are very cannibalistic in those early stages. And we do see a, a rapid reduction in, in larvae numbers, especially if you um, confine them to a, uh, a container. I guess one of the other things that has come up is that, that they lay their eggs in a repeated number of batches by a female. So, so there has been some discussion about the deployment of something like magnet. And that would seem to have a fit in a crop where you might have successive egg lays by a single female. If you can kill her before she lays many egg masses, there would be an advantage there. So there is some thought about magnet deployment, particularly in maize. And I know that in the Ord, where they have quite a big maize crop this year, that they are seriously considering the, the use of magnet to see if it improves their control. We've got NPV for a helicoverpus. What chance have we got something for this full armyworm? leaning on those blokes in the US, maybe we can get some ideas or thoughts off them. What do you think about that? Well, the joke at the moment is whether it's the time to ask for, to bring in a novel virus for Australia. I think not. But <laughs> the situation is that the Spadoptera MPV, which is commercially produced by Ag Biotech and um, available in the States and Africa and I think perhaps in Asia as well, is a novel virus that's not currently present in Australia to the best of our knowledge. It's unlikely that it's come with the fall armyworm because it affects larvae and it's probably just moths that have arrived in Australia. So it, to bring in fallogen, which is the product, it will be dependent on evaluation and approvals from AQUIS. But I think there will be a tremendous amount of pressure exerted on the federal government or whoever is in charge of those decisions to take it very seriously because it certainly would have a terrific fit the Helicoverpa MPV will have no efficacy whatsoever on Spadoptera because it's specific to Helicoverpa. I think it's definitely something that the industry should be discussing and pursuing and exerting whatever pressure they can to at least get the stage where it can be evaluated against other native Spadoptera species rather than just being sort of shut down at the first inquiry. Can I ask Brent, what are you spraying them at this present stage with, Mark? Like I said before, we haven't targeted fall armyworm yet with a, a dedicated insecticide you know, for fall armyworm. Certainly in sorghum and that spray in sorghum, we're just utilising NPV and it's been working exceptionally well. Where we've had mixed populations of northern armyworm, um, sorghum head caterpillar and um, helicoverpa, we've been using methamol or we've been using methamol plus NPV and that's been working exceptionally well on those mixed populations. We haven't found full armyworm in the sorghum head as yet, thankfully. In corn, like I said before, none of my corn crops have been sprayed um, with anything other than NPV for helicoverpa. So, yeah, I'm, 
honestly don't know, you know, what the what the efficacy is against um, full army worm as yet because we haven't chased them with an insecticide as yet. Obviously, we haven't needed to in sorghum and in corn. The numbers have been low enough for us to basically ignore them and just run NPV through the pivot. Uh, just following on from that, Melina, if I may, you know, there's plenty of people up there that might be spraying something, Brent. You might not be spraying, but what are other people spraying full armyworm with? And I include the atherd and table end on that. And how dangerous is it, Melina, that, that they're using some of our good stuff? Unusually for me, I'm happier if they're, they're spraying methamol and synthetic pyrethroids because helicoverpa is already so resistant that we're not trying to manage resistance yes. for those products. My concern is really with broad scale and repeated use of Altacore. For those of you that were familiar with the helicoverpa resistance management strategy that Grains has been working on for a while, we're actually trying to limit the number of exposures that helicoverpa gets to essentially one per crop for the summer pulses and the winter pulses. I think when people start spraying with altacore or electing to spray with altacore in a vegetative crop and even more than once, it's likely that there will be helicoverpa there. So my, my major concern, I think it should be a concern for all the industries, is that we may well, in attempting to control fall armyworm before we understand whether we need to, based on the impact of the defoliation, we may accelerate resistance to indoxicarb and to altacore in particular as a result of chasing fall armyworm and I think that that would be potentially a much more or as equally problematic problem for us to have and I think you know we shouldn't forget that fall armyworm is currently around the world resistant to 41 actives so it's likely that we make that a very difficult to manage species as well so we're in a tricky position because we can't give you definitive information on the thresholds i think it's been really useful to have brent tell us that he hasn't felt the need to rush out and spray we're hopeful that we'll be able to start that sort of defoliation and impact work relatively soon so that there'll be some guidance by next summer for when and when you should and when you probably don't need to spray but at the moment i think that's sort of feeding some of the concern about what we spray and when we spray because we just don't know how often and, and how much we might lose if we get it wrong. A couple of corporates up here producing sweet corn. If you walk into any of those crops here at the moment, they're squeaky clean and um, you can't find any sign of fall armyworm or helicoverpa activity, but that's not unusual for commercial grown sweet corn. So, you know, they're certainly um, banging the hell out of those crops at the moment. But, I mean, that doesn't change anything because, you know, you know, a lot of the good stuff was already um, registered in those crops anyway, so they're already getting exposed to fairly solid populations of helicoverpa anyway. But also, certainly within the horticultural um, industry up here, it's been quite disconcerting in, in the sense that, you know, we've got um, neighbouring farms and that, that are growing um, horticultural crops and they are paranoid about fall armyworm and its, and its potential effect on, on their crops. And so they've certainly been spraying those crops with um, various group 22s, group 28s and that sort of thing that are already registered anyway. And so they're getting a fair old hammering at the moment, you know, and they've been even spraying fence line weeds and grasses and that with um, herbicides mixed with um, insecticides. So it's certainly been a um, bit of an education process just saying to these guys, well, look, you know, don't worry about the full army worm. Continue on with your, you know, your normal agronomy practices. Clearly identify the insect pest, get a good handle on the numbers and make an informed decision based on that. Please don't go out and just spray, blanket spray, you know, 28s and 22s and that sort of thing just because you can and also obviously success neo as well and there's been a lot of that you know go out as a major reseller here in the district we've certainly seen quite a um, an increase in activity and in, in with those insecticides you know within those horticultural crops which is a real concern as well and we're already running at sort of 15 percent resistance to a group 22s here anyway because um of our uses in that during you know through a horticultural, horticultural crops as well so it's a real concern going forward that um, with increased spraying in these horticultural systems that you know we can accelerate um, resistance which is um, at a naturally higher base level than the rest of the country anyway. Melina I have a suggestion if, if uh, BT cotton has an effect on full armyworm why don't we use BT cotton as a trap crop? I have to think about that one. I think it's a great idea, actually. There's only one question in there. Who said BT cotton had an effect on armyworm? My experience is no. 
So it's a question just about that BT cotton, whether it's the VIP that is efficacious. I heard today from one of the sweet corn agronomists that they're, they're getting quite good efficacy from Dipel. So that, that's quite interesting. But I think that's one of the things that would be worth evaluating if we can't get forlogen into the country in any sort of short period of time. You know, something like Dipel, if there's no resistance, might be quite a useful product. Just to finish up then, I uh, will put this presentation and some slides that I prepared that address some of the questions that we might not have got to onto the beat sheet. And if you want any follow-up, please get in touch with uh, either someone in Rod Collins' group, uh, Dale or Isabel, and or myself or Brett. So thank you very much, Brent, for your time and for everyone else for joining in and Scott and Isabel for and Rod for organising everybody to make it here. Thanks very much for organising it all, Melina. Really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone, for the time that you put in this afternoon. It's good to have, I think we had around 30 on at one point, which was really nice. So I appreciate you taking the time out of the afternoon and Brent as well for sharing your knowledge with us. It's really appreciated. No worries. Not a yep. problem. Terrific. Thank you very much, everyone.